Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, welcome everyone to this uh, first um, seminar, uh, first instance of the seminar on contribution of biodiversity. This is part of the project of Charles on uh, responding to um, the taxonomic disorder. Um, and basically, in a short sentence, this this project is is uh, aimed at uh, understanding and at sort of mapping uh, the level of, of um, conceptual disorder around biodiversity research um, in, in conservation science, uh, mostly. Um, and so this is the, the philosophical part of the, of the project that sort of tries to, to see what uh, the extent of the disorder is and, and ways to, to, to solve it. And then my part of the research is, is more historical, so it's trying to see what the the ambiguity of, of the concept, what happens when, when this concept goes into, into uh, the so-called real world and, and, and what happens uh, uh, to people and things and, and forests in my case. Uh, so the, the, um, the seminar is going to have both, hopefully, philosophers and historians. And, uh, hopefully biologists, we're trying to get biologists on the hook, we're uh, trying to get, as just, we were just saying, trying to get lawyers on, trying to get everybody who's got interests in this idea a chance to come talk, hopefully. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the idea. Um, but yes, okay, so, yeah, um, welcome, thanks for being here or being there online. Um, yes, I hope this makes some sense. Um, this, I, like I say, I wasn't exactly, uh, I wasn't exactly planning on being here this afternoon. Um, what this is, is it's sort of a mashup talk of a project that I've that I was working on a little bit uh, a little bit already and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of debating what to do with it which is the first sort of two-thirds or half or two-thirds of the of the slides which is about um, sort of philosophical and empirical research on ambiguous concepts so sort of how do we understand uh, what happens when Key concepts in debates actually don't seem to have static meanings. And there is some really cool uh, philosophical work that's been done on this. What I'm going to actually appeal to a lot in this talk is there's a bunch of really interesting work actually in management studies that has thought about this idea because, well, we'll see. Management people are very interested in the idea, in the question of, you know, so do we have to all, does everyone in a giant corporation have to agree on sort of meanings and goals in order to enable effective collective action? Or can we get by with sort of weird, ambiguous, vague concepts? Um, then I'm going to turn to the bit that's tacked on at the end. It's really something that I'm in the middle of doing right now. I'm going to show you results that I figured out. Uh, under 24 hours ago, which is a nice record. Um, sitting in a sitting in a coffee shop in, 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 in downtown yesterday, trying to trying to see if I could make this make sense, and I think it kind of does. Um, but it's a question about measuring uh, measuring this ambiguity empirically. So how can we try to understand what's going on here in text? Uh, and if we can, or if we can or can't do that. Uh, what does that tell us about, about uh, the, the, the ambiguity uh, in, the, in the term more broadly? What does that tell us about our philosophical goals in understanding what's going on? So that's the basic idea. The two parts kind of sort of are connected to one another. They're connect they make more sense connected together in my head than they maybe do in these slides, but I hope it'll, I hope it'll, I hope it'll make sense. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll start with thinking about a little bit about ambiguity in science in general and in language more broadly. Um, and then, yeah, because, because I think there is a really interesting analogy to be drawn between these kinds of, excuse me, large-scale multi-actor uh, management efforts for biodiversity and management of other kinds of change in the world. I actually think that this, this angle of drawing this connection to organizational choice, studies of organizational, organizational change, it's actually really promising as a way to give us some levers to think about, again, 
as, as, as Max mentioned with respect to his part of this research, I mean, part of one of the things that's really driven me in putting this project together is I'm really interested in thinking about what happens when a concept like this leaves the scientific community, right? Because biodiversity is obviously not just going to be about what uh, an ecologist on the other side of town thinks that biodiversity is, it's also going to be about what the people at the Maison de Développement Durable think that biodiversity is, and what the mayor of Otini de Villeneuve thinks that biodiversity, and this could be radically different notions, and that's, I think there's a really cool kind of uh, you know, trading zone uh, uh, notion going on with a, with a concept like this. And so there's some, good, there's some good aspects, there's some positive aspects to ambiguity, and there's some negative aspects as well that I'll, that I'll poke at. Um, I'll talk a little bit about a taxonomy for, for ambiguity, so how you can think in a bit more general of a way about these ambiguous concepts and then some promising ways to, to study it. Um, so people I've talked about a lot with this include people such as uh, Max, obviously, also Bennett Sterner, uh, close colleague and, and dear friend, uh, who has done some amazing work on uh, some of the empirical sides of ambiguity measurement, and so I really see a lot of what I'm doing is dovetailing into some of the stuff that he's been thinking about. And also, uh, a bunch of this started in, in, in chats uh, with Oliver Lang, who was a postdoc here a few years back uh, on, my, on, my first, on my first project. So uh, that's all been this, has been, this has been very collaborative, very collaborative stuff. OK, so um, a, little bit about, a little bit about ambiguous concepts, right? Biodiversity is weird, uh, because it's one of these things that, in fact, very often we just sort of know it when we see it, right? Uh, when, I, when I introduce this notion in either philosophy of biology courses, or even when I teach this sometimes to, uh, to master's level biology students, you start by just sort of gesticulating at stuff that seems obviously biodiverse. Like that stuff, or like, like that stuff. Like that's obviously really biodiverse stuff, right? Um, so that's all, that's all fine. Um, we're stuck, right? Biodiversity in part because it's a concept that's always had this sort of practical normative valence about it. It's sort of wedged in between a bunch of different demands on it. Um, it has to be more than just contra some uh, work by conservation organizations, which sometimes just focuses on, you know, whales or panda bears or something, right? It has to be more than just saving single charismatic big important species. Uh, because it's supposed to capture something about ecological relationships in addition to just save the, save the panda bears. Um, but you have to not let it totally expand. It's got it's to be something smaller than just like save everything that is alive. Because it's supposed to give you guidance, right? It's supposed to actually be practicable. Uh, and so, yeah, save all the things is not like, it's not like actionable, uh, actionable conservation advice. Um, and that's been true since the very, since the very beginnings of the concept. I mean, that's why it was introduced. We came up with a new word in the late 80s, early 90s, because we wanted a term that had this sort of dual scientific practical sense of this. So the word only dates from... 1988, 89, it wasn't in wide usage until 90 to 92. Uh, and there's also loads of ways of measuring it in science. And so this is actually what a lot of uh, this kind of ambiguity uh, inside the scientific community as well, a lot of what uh, people like Beckett have already worked on. So if you're a scientist, uh, and especially if you're a scientist who wants to build large interoperable big data repositories, uh, you need definitions of your terms either, either to be clear or at least to be specifiable so that you know what sense of a term a particular data set is invoking, right? And so already in science, biodiversity is one of these problematically ambiguous concepts. Uh, the most popular definition is what we just call species richness. That's just basically count up how many species there are in a place, although you, you fiddle the math a little bit because it's better to have more... Uh, phylogenetically distant species than phylogenetically close species, right? That's kind of intuitive. So you, you fudge the math some, but this is a very well understood metric, but there's lots more. Um, there are people who have expressed biodiversity in terms of a diversity of traits or characters. So people have talked about, you know, yeah, what's interesting is like 
evolution found all these ways to do stuff. So what's interesting is that you know what makes things diverse is hey, there's you know mammals that know how to fly, and there's uh, you know. Uh, 75 different ways to solve the problem of nitrogen fixation in the botanical world. These kinds of things where you go, okay, uh, it's about a, a diversity of ways of doing stuff or of traits. Um, people talk a lot about now as well about structural uh, or community level biodiversity. So what might make uh, uh, a system particularly diverse is that it has a lot of things connected in a lot of interesting ways, playing lots of different functional roles. Uh, we'll talk about ecological niche diversity. That's a bit like talking about the traits or characters thing, but that's sort of like diversity of ways of life, right? Ways that you would draw nutrients from the environment and grow and reproduce and thrive, etc. cetera. Uh, and of course, more and more as everything in biology sort of becomes expressed in terms of gene sequences, you can express biodiversity in terms of gene sequences if you want to, right? Uh, so there are absolutely initiatives to essentially uh, the one that I remember. There was a giant NSF grant to basically dredge up the entire bottom of the lake behind uh, the Woods Hole Marine Biological <coughs> Station and grind it all up and sequence it um, to just see how much stuff, like how much, what kinds of wild DNA is in there, you know? And they found a bunch of stuff they'd never seen before. Um, yeah. A small question. Yeah. Uh, out of curiosity, yeah, yeah. mainly. Um, so I was wondering whether, in general, this notion is, as I would intuitively think it, um, more or solely used for larger species, species, or like is there a, just because none of that excludes like bacteria, right? And so and so on. Popularly, you're exactly right, although scientifically more and more there are lots of, there's lots of pressure in the scientific community to recognize not large uh, uh, charismatic, uh, what do call charismatic megafauna, big interesting stuff. Yeah. Um, one place, for instance, where I've seen a bunch of ink spilled over this is there are a lot of people, I think for very good reason, making a lot of noise about soil biodiversity right now. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff that lives in healthy soil. Um, if it dies, there are various kinds of extremely dire predictions about what that means for the ability of you know, things to grow in the ground. Um, so there, that, that, that's one place, for instance, where people are going, guys, there's, there's whole ecosystems here that are an important aspect of this that like, we have to pay more attention to. And so that's part of the fight about these different kinds of concepts, right, is how can we get people to engage with the right kinds of systems in the right kind of way? Yeah, absolutely. Um, sure. And so there's a couple of ways you could respond to this, right? Uh, Big, big asterisk. When I cite Sterner at all here, they're not defending this view. They're explaining it. Uh, they're just telling you about it. Um, Beckett and, and company do not agree with this idea at all. Uh, but one response is what, what you might call fundamentalism. You just say, look, one of these things is right and the rest of them is wrong. There is a correct definition of biodiversity. We need to go out and sort of uh, corral everyone and get them all in the line about what the right answer is. Uh, and so they, they express this in, the, in terms of what they call the definitional consensus principle, which is absolutely what you see in, in places like big data biology, where people basically say, look, we, have to, we just have to agree about this, or otherwise we're not going to successfully encode our results in these large interoperable databases. And so the design of a formal classificatory system for expressing a body of data should be grounded in a consensus about the definitions of the entities that are being classified. So ambiguity bad. Um, ambiguity is a thing to be driven out of scientific practice so that we can be clear about what we're doing with the data that we have. Um, and this is very old, right? Um, so this goes back to the oldest thinking about what language is for and why we have it. Here's Aristotle's rhetoric. Um, we can start then from what he had said elsewhere in the Poetics and the stipulation that language to be good must be clear. It is proved by the fact that speech which fails to convey a plain meaning will fail to do just what speech has to do. It is the condition of excellence for speech that it be non-ambiguous. So I mean, this is something very deep and intuitive about this, which is why I want to be clear that like, I 
When I'm going to argue in here in a bit that, that there are times when ambiguity is good, I think I'm at, I absolutely mean to be saying that that's a vaguely counterintuitive thing to say. I think the classic default intuitive position is that ambiguity is bad and that the scientific process would be better off if we managed to eliminate it. So I think that I, I, I yeah, just underline that I don't mean to be saying that, that that's like an obvious, uh, obviously false position. Um, another response that you could have, and one that I don't want to have, um, is you could just be a skeptic about this. Um, so you could just basically say, well, look what this means, right? The fact that we can't figure out what biodiversity means just means that it's kind of a garbage word. Um, it sort of means whatever the people involved with the science or the politics want it to mean. And so Sohoja Sarkar very famously uh, has argued for this position at some length. You know, biodiversity is just whatever it is that is the stuff that conservation biologists say they're going to save. Um, and so it's just, I mean, it doesn't have any independent meaning. They're just using it to kind of track their own practice. They're just giving a label of what they already wanted to be doing anyway. Um, you can go even farther. Um, this is a paper by, uh, by Carlos Santana, the other, the other Carlos Santana, a uh, buddy of mine, philosopher of biology. Really fantastic paper, provocative. I mean, uh, save the planet, eliminate biodiversity. But the idea is eliminate, yeah, this word is in the way, right? We keep getting hung up on what to do with this concept. Um, it's not actually carrying any conceptual load or doing any work at all. We'll all be better off if we just, just throw this word into the sun um, and, and, and eliminate, it from, eliminate it from practice. And this is, yeah, this is one of my favorite kinds of paper, right? It's a provocative, well-argued paper for something that I don't actually think I agree with, but it's a really well-written and it's interesting. Um, so I, I, strongly, I strongly recommend, recommend that. Um, so those are your two kind of classic options, both acts, uh, both sort of turning around the idea that biology is, or it's biology, that ambiguity is bad, right? And so either you can say ambiguity is bad, so we have to fix it, or ambiguity is bad and we can't fix it, so we have to get rid of the concept. Um, what if you went the other way, right? So what if you went the other way and asked, so what if ambiguity is actually good sometimes? Uh, and there is, an increasing body of literature that says that this might actually be the case. Um, maybe though, some of the oldest literature is on, it, uh, comes out of kind of STS and history science perspectives. So, Starry Griezmann's work on boundary objects. Uh, so these, these sort of entities that exist between domains of science that are sort of constantly renegotiated as people are developing fields. Great classic paper. Uh, there are, for instance, the gene is one of these, which is a great candidate for a thing that, yeah, uh, it depends, what a gene is depends on who's asking and why they're asking, right? And sort of what they're doing with their science, how they want to negotiate their relationships to other fields and to other objects and to other techniques. It's a really nice idea. Um, lots of other people have jumped in on this with respect to uh, biological, you know, scientific concepts or the epistemic goals of scientific concepts, you know, Brigham, Kent Waters, uh, Celso Nato, those are all great papers. A um, little bit of stuff on publication as well, and Man and Evans do a little bit of a little longitudinal uh, empirical analysis to show that actually uh, being ambiguous gets you cited more. So why not? Uh, more people will read your stuff. Um, and then, yeah, Beckett uh, has talked a lot about ambiguity being potentially good. This is a brand new paper. Uh, uh, on in, in, in the context of big data, he really, he really pushes the argument there for the idea that, that, that ambiguity in a big data context could be good. Not just in science, though. Uh, there's this great old paper from the 70s by Page where he actually where he argues, look, uh, uh, ambiguity is really important in politics uh, and does a very technical breakdown of the intuitive, fairly intuitively obvious idea, right? That like being vague lets more people think you're good at you're a good politician and that they like your ideas. Um, intention, deliberate vagueness is, a, is an asset politically. Um, Joya argues about this with respect to strategic vision statements. This is moving toward the kind of business and management literature that I'm going to pick up in a bit. And lots of others. So there's a lot of these kinds of targeted analyses about, about ambiguity maybe actually being helpful. 
Um, I want to shift this a little bit. So what I think distinguishes the, the way that I want to pose this question is most of this literature, at least, at least and especially in the context of the philosophy of science, is about scientific objects and scientific knowledge. Um, either stuff or uh, uh, whatever, putative sequences of uh, DNA, genes, etc., or exchanges between scientific disciplines, conceptual exchange, how do we facilitate interdisciplinary work. There's a bunch of, uh, for instance, that McMahon and Evans paper about, uh, that has the uh, empirical analysis of, of citation and ambiguity in it is talking about the idea that maybe being ambiguous is good because it lets people engage with your work from an interdisciplinary perspective. They don't have to buy into everything your field is selling to be able to use your work. Um, but again, I want to push this. I want to push this broader angle where we get out of the scientific community. Um, so what happens since biodiversity is the kind of thing that also works at this interface between science, government, NGOs, the public, media, etc., etc., etc. Is there a way we can look at ambiguity in that context? Uh, and so, in particular, can we evaluate the use? of ambiguity in, in what I'll call genuinely ambiguous scientific concepts, so places where, like, like I think biodiversity is a, is a paradigmatic example, uh, it's a bit presumptuous to think that we're going to drive the ambiguity out of the scientific practice. Um, and then what happens when we extend that and look beyond the scientific community? So that's the question that I, wanna, that I kind of want to play with here. Um, and I'm going to play with it by, again, looking at this weird literature, uh, but super interesting literature. It's always one of those fun experiences as an academic when you discover that a bunch of people in a field that you've like never heard of or thought of or thought would be relevant are actually all talking about a problem that you're already interested in and think is really cool. And for me, that was discovering that, yeah, uh, uh, management and organizational choice people have been thinking about exactly this question for about 40 years. Um, and they've really strongly, at least there's a, I want to say, it's a consensus because I actually, I, it, would be, it would be presumptuous of me to say that I know the entirety of the field well enough to know whether or not a consensus exists. But what I'll say is there's a strong tradition in that literature of arguing in favor of the utility of ambiguous, uh, ambiguous notions. And so here's Eisenberg, uh, 84, the overemphasis on clarity and openness and organizational teaching and research is both non-normative and not a sensible standard against which to gauge communicative competence or effectiveness. People in organizations confront multiple situational requirements, develop multiple and often conflicting goals, and respond with communicative strategies which do not always minimize ambiguity but may nonetheless be effective. So the idea is non-normative in the sense of maybe it's not necessarily a good thing to focus on clarity and openness and also we shouldn't be in, you know, indicting people for failure to communicate clearly. What people are doing is communicating in ways that fulfill their goals in the weird contexts in which people have to actually engage in communication in large organizational contexts. And Partly, when I read this kind of these last, this list, this long last sentence, I mean, this, this sounds a lot like the biodiversity management world, right? This is, this is what this is like um, when, you look at, when you look at people fighting about what to do about biodiversity. A bit more recently, uh, Jehu here is, uh, are arguing pragmatic ambiguity is a practical solution to the difficulties of collaborative action in situations where different points of view and conflicting interests could lead to organizational paralysis. Um, and again, what I think is really cool here is like, the vocabulary might be a little bit different, like you probably wouldn't see the word organizational, but this sentence is not that different from what might appear in a social epistemology paper, right? Which is kind of cool. There is a, there's a serious overlap here, and I think, I think in a really interesting and useful way. Um, so why are they arguing for in support of ambiguity? What is it that they see that's potentially useful about ambiguity in communication in these contexts? Um, so first, these first two come from, come from Eisenberg. Uh, ambiguity allows for multiple representations of, of goals to exist despite possible underlying disagreement, right? So we might disagree about means. We might disagree about in particular about underlying value commitments, right? 
But if we can all find ways to represent our goals that at least overlap with respect to some of these ambiguous terms, we might get levers for action. Um, it also enables response for change uh, in shifting environments. So if your terminology is flexible enough to sort of absorb a little bit of external change, uh, I think we see this especially in the context of biodiversity. I mean, I, I don't think it's a stretch to say that what conservation looked like in 1993, early in the years of when biodiversity was being developed and promoted as a conceptual tool in conservation thinking, uh, that's not what conservation looks like in 2022 now, right? Uh, it's a radically different discipline with some rapids responded to some radical shifts in the external environment. Some of those are economic, others are, for instance, uh, you might find a little, but I'm thinking you're not going to find that much discussion of climate change in a 1993 uh, you know, paper on goals for, uh, goals for conservation, and now that's become such an important axis as a sort of external shock to uh, uh, thoughts about biodiversity con uh, conservation. Biodiversity has stayed flexible enough to kind of let us absorb that change. Um, a bit from uh, Jarzakowski, I'm going to talk a lot more about, about Jarzakowski et al.'s paper here in a moment. Uh, it lets you sign on to a sort of higher level meaning of a goal without contradicting my, my, my own interests, right? So I could, uh, I, often, I often present this in joke form. Uh, I think it's probably true at this point in you know, 2022 in Europe that if you get 15 people around a table uh, from literally every walk of life from like golf course real estate developers to politicians to ethicists to biologists, everyone at the table is going to say that they think that conserving biodiversity is important. That's pretty much a universally accepted statement. I don't even want to say proposition because I'm certain that the propositional content of that, of that sentence is not the same, right? So that's what these ambiguous concepts can let you do, right? They can let you sign on to a goal even if uh, the way that maybe somebody else at the table is signing on to the goal contradicts my interest. Um, and similarly, and this is a lever that I'll talk about a lot more in a second, um, perhaps they let us shake out of these disagreements or these differences of interpretation levels in which there actually is enough in agreement, especially to facilitate short-term local collective action. And that can be huge. That can be all, that, may, that may be all we can hope for. And so if ambiguity is an important part of getting us there, I think that can make it, that can make it really interesting. Um, there are, of course, bad things, right? And, and so this is part of, this is another part of kind of what I'm trying to do with this, with this project is to give us tools to think about how to evaluate instances of ambiguity to see whether or not we're getting more of the good stuff or more of the bad stuff. What's the bad stuff? Well, you can plausibly deny the unwanted consequences. Right? Um, so you can, you can say that you always did what you always wanted according to the way that you understood the ambiguous notion and sort of say, well, I never meant to cause all this massive harm uh, because it, didn't, it wasn't part of the way that you were understanding the problem. Um, it might re-entrench existing power differentials. And this is something that, uh, well, it's actually kind of hilarious, another, another long tradition in uh, organizational change literature, because it's where the people are, uh, is to examine organizational change in universities. Uh, and reading papers about organizational change in universities is really funny. Uh, but one thing that is often underlined in that context is, yeah, how many times can you think of you know, a, high, a university higher up explaining something to you in an ambiguous way where it's clear that the reason that the ambiguity is there is for the person to be able to have the power to do exactly what they wanted to do anyway and not take you seriously, right? And ambiguity is very good at that. Uh, and this might be a, this may be a relevant lesson in, in a biodiversity context, right? You can imagine the real estate developer uh, using the term in a sufficiently ambiguous way to still get to build the golf course, right? Um, Enables proliferation of multiple meanings, which obscures action, right? So on the one hand, it might enable certain kinds of action, but on the other hand, it might, it might hide uh, 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 certain kinds of ways forward uh, that we may not be able to see. Uh, and then this is a, uh, comes from a really, 
really cool article that I wish I had time to, to, to unpack here uh, about a theory of organizational change that they call the, uh, the garbage can model. Um, it permits the appearance of decisions that don't actually resolve any problems. So what you might see happen uh, is you might see a situation where essentially, so we all agree that we need to do something about problem X, but problem X is sufficiently vague and we move sufficiently slowly that over a period of time we basically evacuate all the content out of problem X and turn it into different problems or move it somewhere else in the organization and then we say, oh wow, well, you know, problem X is actually really easy to solve now. Because the, the, the term has remained vague and we've just dumped out all the content. Everything that was hard about the problem has been shoved away somewhere else. And so we, we think we've made some kind of great decision to solve some kind of important problem, but in fact we haven't, we haven't actually resolved any of the stuff that had pushed us to want to make the choice in the first place. Um, that one feels real act like the universities, right? Uh, Ah uh, yes, we're going to fix the problem of blah, and then actually, you no, know, you just you take all the parts, you give them to someone else, and then you declare that you solved the issue, right? Uh, so let's get some, let's get a little bit more tools. How do we how do we think about about ambiguous language in a bit more with a bit more clarity? Um, I'm going to draw this taxonomy out of this this wonderful paper by by Polly Archipkowski et al. Uh, group in the UK. They did a really long longitudinal study on a giant change that took place at some, uh, it's anonymous, so I, I don't know which one, some UK business school. So they were looking, they wanted to get a certification. And there was all these internal fighting about what was it gonna, was it gonna be worth it? And what would it mean? And why would we want it? And if we're gonna get it, how are we gonna get it? And who's gonna have to do the work? And what are we actually gonna change? Um, and they analyzed in, I mean, painstaking detail. They sat with thousands of pages of minutes from meetings, and position papers, and documents. They analyzed all the rhetoric surrounding this fight. And interviews as well. They did, they did personal interviews. Uh, they did all kinds of stuff. Um, it's actually problematic for me. I'm going to come back to that, right? How can we do that in a context that's dispersed as biodiversity? But anyway. Um, and they found that this rhetoric shared some characteristics. Uh, and so first, we're going to have two axes that we can sort of cut this rhetoric up along. On the one hand, people's rhetoric usually tended to be either situated, so particular to the group, right, in-group specific. And so we're going to build it in terms of our position and our interests, right? We're going to define it, we're going to structure the way that we define an ambiguous term in terms of how, how we see uh, uh, the, the state of affairs. Or it can be accommodative, and so where you're intentionally trying to express your position in such a way that you're letting in other people's interests. And it really did tend to be that this was pretty bimodal. People tended to be in the process of doing either one or the other thing, more or less, most of the time, right? Um, similarly bimodal, uh, the meanings that get ascribed to the concept tend to be either narrow, so minimally ambiguous, usually constructed from a single perspective, or wide, where you're baking into the meaning of the concept the idea that there are divergent or conflicting interests or, or goals about its use. So that gives you four different kinds of rhetoric. Um, and I've even kind of tailored these to the biodiversity question here. Uh, situated narrow rhetoric, right? That's going to be stuff like scientific journal articles or internal corporate reports, right? We're talking to our people in terms of our values, and we're defining concepts in terms of how we think they should be understood. We're not talking to anybody else. Um, so yeah, scientific journal article, perfect example, right? Um, situated wide rhetoric tends to be used when we're trying to argue in favor of one view against our competitors, right? So I'm situated in the sense that I'm coming from my own position's perspective, but I'm trying to define the term in a way that's going to convince other people that my perspective is right. So I have to meet them part of the way in terms of the sort of meaning of the term, but I'm still sort of fighting for my own thing. Um, accommodative wide rhetoric is big, happy, vision statement, mission statement, IPCC report, where we're trying to say everyone is in the tent and everyone has their contribution to the meaning of this very broad concept. Um, accommodative narrow is perhaps the most interesting 
from our perspective, uh, it's sort of, so, so we're talking about narrow meaning, so we're driving a stake in the ground, we're fixing the meaning of the term reasonably precisely, but we're being accommodative about our goals and our position at the moment to try to let other people in, and so what they argue is, it's actually here that you saw a lot of collective action potential emerge. So people are fixing the meanings enough to give us a way to talk more broadly about, uh, about our broader goals. And that's really interesting. Um, what can you do? Well, uh, yeah, and again, empirical observation, right, uh, that, they, that, they, that they draw from this, this giant analysis that they did. Everybody used all types of rhetoric over the three years, rather than converging on one position or the other over time. Constituents were able to shift between the types of rhetoric as they saw fit to justify and validate their own colleagues' and organizational interests and actions, often adopting positions of each type during the same passage of speech, interview, or meeting. So people are bouncing back and forth all the time. Uh, you really have to be careful about how you analyze this because people are going to play with this even, even over the course of, of a long meeting. And so, I mean, that means that it's really, it, it can't be a question of sort of giving normative privilege to one of these kinds of speech because we're not going to be able to, to drive the others out. That's not how communication actually works in these kinds of contexts. But what I think we can do is we can start to ask the question about the contexts where each of those kinds of engagements occurs. So maybe we can talk about how, how and when is it that we wind up in an accommodative narrow context. What does that mean? When do we get there? What are we, uh, uh, what are we doing when we're in those kinds of contexts? And how should people engage in each of those kinds of contexts? So that you can kind of, you know, call a foul essentially on, on people. It's like, you know, that, that kind of behavior in this kind of context, that's not the way you should be manipulating an ambiguous, an ambiguous concept. Um, there's a lot of worries here, not least among them, of course, communication is a, is a, is a three-place relation, essentially, right? You need goals of the communicator, you've got the linguistics uh, choices made by the communicator, and you've got the interpretation put onto that communication by the receiver. It's a lot of data. Uh, that's a lot that you need to know about to be able to evaluate uh, a situation. It's not clear that we have what we need to study this empirically, data-wise. And I'm going to come back to this uh, in a bit for my last kind of wildly speculative 15 minutes of the talk here. Um, you know, Stern's even argued that this is true in the science. Like, we don't even know what we need to know about what the scientists are doing to be able to look at the ambiguity inside scientific practice. Much less if I want to do this crazy thing that I'm interested in and look at what happens when it leaves the scientific community. Um, so if it's already a problem there, it's, I'm, I'm just making the problem worse. Um, it, Sturge tried a little bit, and I think a really interesting and promising way, to think about how we could look at this empirically, how we could understand uh, the presence or am, uh, absence of some of these kinds of ambiguity in uh, textual contexts, at least. Uh, so it is, he says, here it, it, it is possible to formulate testable generalizations relating how often and in what context the term is used, communicative goal being prioritized, and circumstantial factors of use, including linguistic and social context available, and the background knowledge of, of participants. That should be a thing that we should be able to do. Um, how to do it is the fun and, and exciting challenge. I'll, I'll jump through very quickly uh, uh, Sterner's proposal, which revolves around partial synonym networks. So these are clusters of terms like function, evolutionary function, and biochemical function, where we kind of know, well, they overlap, but they don't totally overlap because they're not quite the same, but they're definitely sharing some semantic space. Um, you can quantify that kind of ambiguity uh, as a kind of entropy measure across contexts, and it would look something like this. This is an equation out of his, out of his paper. Um, you know, the entropy of a, an invocation in a, in a context is of a, uh, yeah, of, a, of, a, of a network in a context, just summing over those uses, uh, the entropy of each use in each context times the probability of the context. So kind of a classic linguistic entropy measure. Uh, the lower that is, the less ambiguous the use of the, the, use of the term in the network is going to be. Um, as I understand it, the last time we had, the last time we had a meeting about this, uh, 
they flush this theory out, they think it's going to work, they're trying to figure out what data to apply it to and how to get it to work in practice. So they're working on it. Um, so now, um, official rank speculation alert. So this is where the talk goes weird. Um, because this was this is where I started trying to think about how I would how I would analyze this with the kinds of tools and data that I have that I have available to me. And what that's looked a lot like lately for me is topic models. That's what I've been spending a lot of my time playing with in my recent digital humanities work. What's a topic model? If you don't know what a topic model is, a topic model is a tool that automatically splits a corpus into actually something that looks a lot like contexts in uh, Sterner's sense. Uh, via a machine learning approach. So you tell it the number of topics you're interested in finding out, uh, and it's going to tell you which documents invoke those topics with which kinds of probabilities, and which uh, words are involved in those topics at which probabilities. Uh, I'll come back to that in a little bit. There's different intuitive ways to think about what a topic model is doing. Um, what are some of the advantages of this? Uh, one that I actually didn't put on this list is just that it's actually a very mathematically clear object, what a topic model is in the end. It's just a set of probability distributions. And so we can, we can do lots of really nice math on sets of buckets of probability distributions. This is a thing we can really play with, which is part of why I like it. I mean, once, once you have these, once you've asked the computer to derive all of these distributions for you, you can start to fiddle with stuff. Um, they're document level rather than word level. And so that might contextualize things a little bit. Of course, for those of you keeping score at home, you may also remember that uh, Pezhukovsky et al. just argued that actually people switch what kinds of meanings they use and what kinds of context sometimes very quickly. Um, I don't yet know what that means for a method like this. It's uh, something that I, I'm just, I think, going to have to get a feel for empirically. Um, but in lots of cases, I think it's fair to say, uh, the overarching use of a context and of a, uh, of a, of a a given meaning of an ambiguous term in a particular published piece is probably going to be fairly static, except in cases where people are engaging in explicit comparison or trying to use more than one context at once. And like I say, I think it's an empirical question whether uh, this approach can pull those apart. Uh, documents can mix topics, so topic membership is probabilistic, so that's really nice. Uh, there's lots of nice, well-known, again, because these are mathematically robust objects, there's nice analyses of robustness and results. Uh, and topics tend to be interpretable, and this I think is really nice as well. I'm not going to dwell on it right now. Uh, but one problem that I think that you might have with, a, uh, with, a, with an approach like uh, Sterner's entropy approach is you're going to have tr a bit of trouble interpreting what a context is. Uh, if a context is just sort of, maybe it's a window of words around the use of the term that you're interested in, uh, that doesn't really tell you like, but what, what is it? Like, what are they talking about when they use biodiversity? Topics tend to actually give you a really, uh, the results of the topic model tend to give you a really nice handle on that. They really do tend to look like topics in a colloquial sense. They tend to pick out, uh, this is an evolutionary ecology topic. And so papers that are high probability for this tend to be about evolutionary ecology. And so the, 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 machine, the machine learning results really seem to grab something a bit, a bit more, uh, a bit more comprehensible. So the intuition that I want to play with here is: so if biodiversity appears in lots of different topics that seem like they're about wildly different things in a corpus, but it seems like either each of those invocations of the term is carrying a different meaning, and then we could explore those by unpacking the topics, or the term is serving as a bridge between different topics. Um, Asterisk. I don't know how to tell those two things apart yet. Uh, but let's start with just a, a more basic question. What I've been what I've been playing with lately is how do you, how do you quantify this, right? How do you even how do you start? Uh, so another intuitive way to think about what a topic model is doing is that it's inducing a kind of k-dimensional vector space over a corpus, uh, and that vector space gives you at least a locally optimal model for each document as a vector in the space. Uh, and so you're defining, you're, you're deriving with, with the uh, Gibbs sampler, usually. Uh, you're deriving both the basis vectors and the vectors for the documents at the same time. That's why it's a complicated machine learning approach. I'm not telling it what the bases are in advance. It's figuring out the basis at the same time that it's situating the documents. Um, 
And then each basis vector is just a probability distribution over every word in the corpus. So you're thinking about every document as being a mix of these topics, where each topic is a distribution over the words, and that's what gives you your words in your document. Um, it's sort of like proposing a really weird model for how you would write a paper as being like iterative sampling from probability distributions and then inferring those probability distributions as though they were actually how the papers were written. Um, so what can, what can you do with the results of one of these? Well, easy things are, uh, say, cosine distance between either the basis vectors or the vectors for the document. So that answers a question intuitively like, how similar are the topics? Or how similar are the documents? Um, that's a very easy, it's, it's cosine distance, it's a very well understood, actually there's five or six other distance metrics for distances between probability distributions like this. So there's lots of different ways you can choose to, to measure how far apart these things are. Um, another thing that's very easy is to inspect the content of the probability distributions themselves. That's, there's, so there's two kinds of distributions, so there's two kinds of question. How important is a given word for a given topic? So in topic number seven, how important is the word, how probable is the word biodiversity? That's just a conditional probability. And the other question that's very easy to ask is, uh, given a document, how important is a particular topic? So how many of the words, how probable was it that a word from document number 19 came from topic number seven? Very easy, very easy questions. Uh, Things that aren't that are progressively more difficult. So this is kind of your palette for thinking about simplistic analyses on the basis of, of topic models. And so, I don't know, um, here's a guess. Uh, here's an entirely speculative model for a way that you might do this. Uh, you want to ask something like the question, to what extent is a word used in topics that are radically different from one another? Uh, and you've got to start somewhere because you're in a non-oriented vector space. So you pick a central topic T. Uh, and so I decided entirely arbitrarily that we can call that the topic in which that word is most likely. So what's the topic that talks most about biodiversity? Um, the topic for which the probability of biodiversity is the highest. And then we can compute the ambiguity just by summing over all the topics. Uh, the probability of that word in that topic times the distance cosine similarity between the central topic and, the, distant, and the, the topic at issue. So distance between topics times likelihood of word and topic. It's like the simplest thing that could possibly work. This was like the most basic thing I could think of. Um, largely because proving that anything works in digital humanities from first principles is almost impossible. So my goal is to start with the simplest thing that could possibly work because maybe I can justify that to an angle. Um, anything more complicated than this is going to be very hard to, ju to justify to review or two. Um, what do you get? Oh, oh, I should also say, so, so I wanted to play with this, right? But I don't have a corpus that I think would give interesting results for testing biodiversity on. Um, that's for lots of reasons that I'm going to come back to in a little bit. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a little, you know, one thing that's very wide open for me still is, so what is the right corpus for exploring biodiversity? Uh, with these kinds of methods. I don't know yet. Uh, so I just sort of scrolled through my hard drive until I found a topic model that I already had. Uh, in this case, it was uh, the entirety of the biology part of Proceedings of the Royal Society from 1907 to 2014. I happen to already have a nice 75 topic model of that. Uh, and so I just played with stuff and, and hey, nice. Um, you get results that kind of seem to intuitively track what you would expect. So I just picked some terms at random that I thought seemed to make sense. Uh, the ambiguity of cause is higher than the ambiguity of evolution, which is much higher than the ambiguity of the term nucleic. Tracks what I would have pre-theoretically expected. Um, evolution is used in all kinds of different contexts in biology. Uh, nucleic is not. Uh, so this sort of jives with the kinds of results that I thought I would see. Um, it's a long way from being anything, anything very meaningful. Uh, but that leaves me with a bunch of questions that I don't know how to answer. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand wave at it. Um, yeah, is this justified from first principles about, about these probabilities? I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea how to make an argument that this is actually a, a tracking the kind of thing that I wanna track. Um, 
Is it sensitive to the choice of distance? I should say distance measure, not similarity measure, although they're just the inverse of one another. Uh, is it sensitive to the choice of distance measure, or is it sensitive to the choice of central topic? In my very limited testing, no. Uh, you would expect it, I think, based on the way the distributions are constructed, not to be uh, sensitive to the choice of central topic. I think that's analytic. Uh, similarity measure is less clear, uh, but it seems to give the same kinds of results, the same orders of results regardless. Um, does it fail in some important way that I haven't thought about yet? Probably. Um, I do not know. I have been just ludicrously tired for the last week, so uh, this algorithm, this talk could just be a fever dream at this point. I don't know. Uh, but, but I think there, 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 may be, there may be something interesting here from a, from a technical standpoint. But now let's back up. Um, so how do you apply, like how would you apply this? Whether, whether my method or Sterner's method, you know, let's, 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 say, let's ask this question, you know, what good is it to quantify ambiguity in these, in these kinds of contexts? Um, I'll play with that question before I talk about what's on this slide. Um, I do think that that's important in, in part because uh, the intuition that there is ambiguity here is often completely unexplored in these literatures. I mean, it really is, it just sure feels like it must be that we must not all mean the same thing. Uh, I think being able to really demonstrate that empirically would be really nice. I also think, and this is where I'll, I'll come back and make a little hand wave in the direction of these topics being interpretable. And I think if, if we can use an empirical analysis to teach us about the relationship between these contexts, I think that's really interesting. Um, I don't entirely yet know how that looks. I mean, these distance measures are going to be relevant in my context uh, for, my, for, my, for my approach. I'm not yet entirely sure how that looks, but I do know that having a little bit of an empirical assist when I want to break down one of these analyses would be really helpful to me. Uh, getting a little bit of an idea about where to look would be cool. Um, lastly, there's a big problem still right here. Uh, and that's what corpus should I throw at this. Uh, and this is problematic for two different reasons, at least. Um, important reason number one is it's just not clear what text is the right text. It's just not clear how to get uh, enough people talking about biodiversity in enough different ways to make it an interesting object of analysis. I mean, I suspect that this is one reason, to be perfectly frank, I suspect that this is one reason that this kind of project, looking at this concept at the science society interface, has never really been conducted. Because it's much easier, I actually have this corpus, it's much easier to go collect, uh, I have 43,000, 43,000 articles about taxonomy. I have those. That's fine. Uh, so if I want to know how taxonomists think about one of these concepts, I can, I can ask that of the scientific, the scientific literature, scientific meetings, publications, presentations. This is all a sort of well-understood area. Where do I go to ask that if I want to try to figure out what happens when that leaves the scientific community? It's not clear. So there's question number one is, is, is very fundamental. Question number two is a little, or problem number two, I should say, is a little bit more, a little bit more technical. And that is, if the documents are really different, if they're written in a really different way, then there's a sort of worrisome trend that topic models turn into basically type classifiers. Because the computer is very good at noticing that internal corporate reports aren't written like scientific journal papers. And so if essentially all I'm getting is not a measure of content of these sort of differences in contextual use of, of a term. What I'm getting is, how distant does the computer think the style of a corporate report is from the style of a journal article? That's not really meaningful, right? And so I don't really yet know, this is, I mean, for me this is something that's just, I, I think I just have to try a bunch of empirical tests, right? I think I just have to play with stuff uh, to try to find out whether that's a surmountable problem or not. And it may not be. It may just be that there's nothing here but a sort of type classifier 
Uh, and so this method doesn't work if you leave science. It works if you give it a bunch of reasonably identical journal articles. But if you get any weirder than that, it just doesn't tell you anything interesting. Um, so with that, I think that is, yeah, that's all, that's all I wanted to say. So, uh, yeah. Shall we, uh, should we take five? Your choice. Let's take five. Um,
Sit so over here. So. so. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to think. Um, it, it's it's more it's wilder than I thought it was. <laughs> um, yes, I added I added extra weirdness <laughs> in the last few days. So. Um, and and uh, I guess my I have several questions, but maybe I, I can start by the, the 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 last thing that you mentioned about the, what kind of corpus would you yeah. would you um, choose? And 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 for me, maybe maybe it. it uh, it's more complicated, that, but for me, that's isn't it just a matter of choice? It's a matter of, of choice and accessibility to having that corpus, and also of, of, of for me would maybe intuitively be a matter of of interpret interpretative choice of, of saying mm -hmm. uh, I'm interested in this sort of question, um, and, and this 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 connects with with um, perhaps I, I missed it, but. Um, when we quantify ambiguity, um, as we, we saw with the example of evolution, chance, and, and uh, uh, gene, that um, there you, you compare it between three different concepts, right? But here we have something right. different. We have bi how biodiversity, the ambiguity of biodiversity compared to what? And good, and so good, and, good, good, good. Okay. And having, is this a matter, a way of, for example, could we? Quantify, quantify change in ambiguity over time, for example, or could we good. compare different yeah. disciplines and say, yeah. well, actually, technical yeah, forestry it's much less ambiguous than scientific forestry, for example, or or conservation biology is much more um, concrete than, than evolutionary biology. So, so if if, good. if it's good. a matter of, of um, a specific question that, that you have in mind, um, good. Let me get right. wouldn't that help solve the the question of, of Corpus. Yes. Okay. Good. Two. Two good. Really good linked questions. Sorry, I forgot to get my notebook. Right. Okay. Um. Okay, yeah, so, uh, good, so, I want, yeah, let me, let me take them, actually, I think it makes sense for me to take them in turn. Um, so, yeah, on the one hand, I mean, of course, from a, I mean, in a, in a, in a pragmatic sense, you're, you're obviously somewhat right, obviously, part of what's going to try, a de decent part of what's going to drive this is just what can I get my hands on, what makes sense. Um, but in terms of that, that broader question about, okay, so, so isn't it just about kind of, or what would the desiderata be? And I think that's, what's, that's, why, that's, why, I pulled this, that's why I pulled this slide, this slide back up at, at, at the end. Um, and this will this, segue nicely into the, into the second half of, of your question. Um, if the point is to try to figure out how ambiguous and in what kinds of contexts are people being ambiguous about this term, then I do at least want the corpus to be broad enough that it captures some of these importantly different meanings, right? That it has not just the way that one community thinks about, about the idea or writes about the idea, more importantly, more, more, more precisely, um, but that it has how multiple communities write about the idea, so that then we can try to detect well, how differently do they use the word when they, when they write about it. Um, now that, that gets, to your, that gets to, your, to your second point. This I wasn't clear about at all, so let me, that's, that's, that's very nice. I should, I should say more, more precisely what, what, I, what I did there and why. Um, and the reason that I showed those couple of test numbers was not because that's what I think I would do in, the, in this context. It was just to say that like, it seems like it intuitively tracks ambiguity as I might expect that to appear in uh, that particular corpus. Um, so what would you do with that term in this context, or with that, with that metric in, in, in a biodiversity context? As you say, you got one concept, you don't have, you don't have a lot. Um, the hope would be, so on the one hand, the absolute value is already interesting, 
right? Because that's a bit of an empirical handle on this question of, is it actually ambiguously used? Or as it turns out, is there less ambiguity here than we thought? And for me, that's still, I think, an open empirical question, um, at least in the way that, that it might appear in, in writing. Uh, for me, that's still a bit of an open empirical question. It may be that, to put it, it may be that there's more, if you will, practical contradiction than there is linguistic, textual, conceptual contradiction, right? It may be that even actually all of those people around the table who say that they want to conserve biodiversity, they may actually all even agree about what biodiversity is and just not be willing to act on it in the same kinds of ways. I mean, for me, that's still an open, that's still an open question. So there's part one. Part two is, I do think, and this is where I'm, I'd have to play with this, and I don't have any good ideas about this yet. I, I gestured at this really briefly, but, but, but too briefly, so let me say more. I would hope that part of what being able to quantify this would let you do is let you be able to uh, unpack and compare the contexts that contribute most to ambiguity. And so you could look at the different you know, terms in this sum, right, and try to figure out where is it that there is, that there are, in fact, um, you know, where are there uses, both where uh, the left hand, the, the, the left hand term, it's really important to a topic, and the right hand term, a topic is way far away from the way that you normally use biodiversity. Where are those contexts? Which ones are they? Um, you also are absolutely right, you can do this over time. And that, I think, is really important. There's a couple of different ways to do that. Um, I can get technical. You can either use a regular topic model and break it up over time, or you can actually use dynamic topic models where you actually let the values of those, of those distributions change over time, which is cool. Um, either way, um, I think over time is really interesting. Uh, you might expect a kind of... Uh, well, it's related to another question that I've always been interested in exploring in DH contexts, which is about kind of knowledge diffusion. And so you might a priori sort of expect that it would start less ambiguous because it's coined by a group of scientists wanting to do sciencey things and becomes more ambiguous that's being released into the world. Um, Biodiversity might be so weird that in fact that's not the case, right? And maybe that it was coined ambiguous and stayed ambiguous because the biologists were already already had. I mean, we've talked about this, right? The biologists already had these practical goals in mind, and so it just never wasn't ambiguous. It always had a billion different meanings, even in the scientific community. Uh, that would be a very interesting empirical question to try to, to try to get a handle on. And so, yeah, it's not, you're right, it's not, I didn't mean to say that it's just, you know, sort of the value of that equation for the word biodiversity is in itself not, I mean, it's, it's somewhat interesting, but I think it's more like once you have a quantifiable method, you can start to play around the edges and pull out, pull out threads and, and, and hopefully look at some more fine-grained structure here. It's what I would want to do anyway. Um, I don't know if it would work or not. Uh, but hopefully that's helpful. You wanna, we could, we can bounce or you can keep going, it's up to you. No, 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 no. Yeah, just, just a quick question, but, but maybe because I didn't completely follow, I mean, I, I really like the idea of trying to measure, quantify the, the amount of ambiguity that is given a certain word or concept. My worry, again, which may be unfounded, was that what you're measuring here may not be the ambiguity, but more kind of generality of the term. Ah, interesting. Good. Like, obviously, if a term is very general, like false, you're going to find it in all the kinds of topics, and it's going to be widely used with a high probability. Very good. So what you're tracking is the generality rather than the ambiguity. Very good. Which that's really, that's said, really important. And it kind of goes back to what you just said. It feels a bit strange that if a word would be common and be used by various topics, just, just by that fact, the word will become more ambiguous, it seems kind of... Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's, that's really nice, and I think this is a place where, um, well, it comes back to, uh, it's, a, it, it's actually, there's a sense in which that's, that's, 
I could, have, I could have expressed this point in those terms as well, right? That is to say, something serving as a bridge between lots of different topics, but always meaning the same thing, it's just a general term, right? It's not an ambiguous term. And I think here is a place where I think there, there's really nothing to say, but look, you've got to back up your, uh, you've got to back up your digital stuff with close reading here, right? And I think that, you know, I, I'm always at pains whenever I, you know, it's good, I, didn't, I, I wouldn't have wanted to go, uh, whatever, two hours on YouTube without making this point, because every time I talk about DH, I, I feel like I have to underline it. You know, I am not, uh, and I don't think almost anyone is these days, uh, you know, not advocating for throwing out close reading. And I think this is a place where you have to do exactly that. I think you're gonna have to unpack. Uh, if you see a high, a high punitive ambiguity value, um, I think you're going to have to unpack what, what that means. Uh, but also, again, I'm, I'm hopeful. What I what I would like out of this is help knowing where to look, uh, because that's I mean, in, in essence, part of the issue here is that this is just sort of an unbearably vast idea of a project, and so that really is a lot of what what I want the computer to help me with is just what, what's the what's the what's the right entry point. I suppose you will answer exactly the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so let's imagine you, it works. So you have some kind of metric of ambiguity that works and contextual or just not too broad, not too narrow. It's not a mess and it works. But there's a part in the literature of management that you talk about that is really important. It's about the strategic use of ambiguity. Mm -hmm. So there's some kind of intentionality in the rhetoric. So you want to convey something and the, the author decide to be how much ambiguous. It's not just the community Good. they find blah blah blah. It's also the individual writer is trying to do something in the text. And I suppose for now we have no idea how to do that automatically. No. But a close reading will probably give it. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. The one thing that the one thing that I can think of, and I do think that this would be would be important. Um, the one thing that I can think of is, uh, as well as correlations across across time, uh, if this gives you a way to track uses across fields, I mean, one thing that would be very interesting, at least one way to start to get a handle on that, would be if you could see. Uh, For instance, if within what feels to you like a, uh, I'm trying to think of the right way to phrase this, if within what feels like to you a single kind of disciplinary tradition or a single way of approaching the field, um, you see uh, really stark mixes across different documents of different topics that invoke biodiversity in what feels like different ways. Then you might, excuse me, then you might start to think there's something rhetorical going on. Now, of course, it's not a, that's not a necessary condition, no. right? That's a, it would be a way, but it'd be a way to detect it. Could be a clue. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's sort of a, a, an empirical evidence that, that uh, uh, yeah, that people are, not sort of taking on how to put it. They're not. They're not. They're not taking on a definition as part of their, you know, disciplinary uh, presuppositions. They're playing with them as it as it as it makes sense. Um, but you're right. I mean, if you if you don't see that, that doesn't rule out that there's not. So I mean, that doesn't mean that there's not something strategic going on anyway. Uh, and that's. I mean, that's always that's always hard. And that's. I mean, I've I've written about this. I've written about this elsewhere. I mean, one thing that I think is course important as well is uh, no it's not as though that problem goes away if you're just talking about journal articles mm -hmm. right scientists are oh, engaged in very serious rhetorical pursuits when crafting papers we were talking about that today with Peter if if you are in the game of persuade the other colleagues of something ambiguity is a tool mm -hmm. and you use it Voluntarily, it's not on, it's not just my community. It's, it's part of the game because you want to convince the others that gene blah 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 we should do that. Right. 
and and our colleagues, historians and sociologists, show that ambiguity is part of the toolbox of to convince other people that you're right. Yeah, that's a big. I mean, that's that's one of the. Uh, if I'm remembering rightly, it's been a while since I've read it, but if I'm remembering rightly, that's one of the uh, the things that's important about the uh, or that's mentioned in the. Uh, the old Reesmer paper on boundary objects is exactly that kind of usage. That it was a, it was a, in part a rhetorical play for for kind of jockeying for position. You know, the wars over will molecular biology take over biology. Uh, that's kind of part of what's at play there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so, no, I think I mean I think this is I think this is very important, and I think I think one thing that I mean this is part of why. In some sense, I, 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 am, I am, my publication history so far on this stuff is very weird because I, I have right now a lot more work at the meta level than I do at the practical level. I've spent a lot of time trying to think about why I use these things and what are they really going to tell you because I'm scared about these kinds of questions, frankly. Um, and, and I think I think one thing that we need, and I think this is a lesson that we learned from our colleagues over in linguistics, is I think we need a better understanding of how do we get from how do we get from language to concepts, and what are the rhetorical goals of scientists in crafting articles, and all these kinds of structuring questions about what's the real content of a paper, um, and and there are. A number of actually radically uh, incompatible theories in the you know science studies and and a little bit in field science community about like so why do you write a journal article what's it for what are people trying to do um, and of course the answer can't have nothing to do with communicate true propositions about science because then scientists wouldn't bother to read papers and. As anyone who spent some time in a lab knows, Journal Club is a very important part in the weekly life of any science lab, right? Like scientists spend ludicrous amounts of hours weekly reading articles. And so they've got to be getting some propositional content out of them. But then what else is going on? Less clear. Uh, and I, I, I tend to think, and this, I mean, this fits exactly with your question, I tend to think that, that our answers to that question are actually going to have a lot to do with our answers to like, what kind of philosophy, what kind of philosophical content can you get out of doing digital stuff on science. And I think we don't spend enough time, I think we, I think we have a bit, we often have, and I, I happily accuse myself of this too, I think we often have a bit too naive of an idea about the kind of propositional content of a science paper. Uh, that it's just going to tell us about how scientists think and what they believe and how they work, and it's just we just kind of take the terms at face value and crunch the crunch the stuff out, and we get the con we get the conceptual content. And I'm I'm cognizant of and worried about that not being the case. And then of course that's in science. It's I mean undoubtedly weirder if you say have a corpus that's got a bunch of I don't know IPCC reports in it or something, right? That's going to get really weird. If you ever read segments of those, but they're rhetorically very strange objects. They have they speak their own weird language. For good reason, I mean they, Do you need you anything you do? And a level of caution that not even the most cautious scientist would take in writing a journal article. Uh, a phrase that expresses every level of credence in the proposition that follows it, like little markers for like, I am 62% confident in P. And they can write that in their, they can write that in an IPCC report. Like, they have this whole table of probability values and phrases. <laughs> literally, literally. Uh, like not even the most uptight scientist is gonna write that carefully. <laughs> Risky expertise that, that, that I edited. There's one of the economists that choose this language. That oh, cool. a few pages about, and it's super weird. It's <laughs> really weird. And now they pass less numbers, more words. Yes. Yeah. They discover that people react better to words. But how do you show? Very probably, substantially probably. 
parsley on the feet. <laughs> wild. It's wild. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm fully open to the possibility that, like, if I drop one IPCC report, say, into a topic model, it just explodes. Because, like, it just does not know how to, the rhetoric is so different that it's like, you have this cluster of everything else, and then, like, this one document, like, by itself, off in the middle of nowhere, right? That is actually really possible. And I, you know, I, I like I say, I, I, I don't know how to handle that other than to try it and see what happens. Um, unfortunately, I would like to be confident before I start the project that it might work. Like, I don't know how to, to just try it and see what happens. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I have uh, a lot, I guess, uh, comments, thoughts, and questions uh, that we can see what, what is interesting. Uh, first, a very, like, uh, maybe an application of what you say um, in the talk itself. Um, so I was quite curious about this small point in, in, a, in a citation you had, citation you had uh, where you used, or the author that you quote, used the word non-normative, or is not normative. And I mean, yeah. at least from, and you translated that as not being good or something, or not being useful for normative reasons, which is not at all what the word means, as I understand it, so yeah. there seems to be some ambiguity, ambiguity <laughs> going on. Uh, as I, I don't see, but maybe I misunderstood the citation, but that seemed clearly normative, whatever was there. As I um, parsed what they meant, um, I think what they mean is, uh, as in not being a norm, it is not a norm of good communication. It should not be held out as a norm. Yeah, but that's something else, right? Um, <laughs> They're not normative? No, I think that's what they mean, though. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. I think that's what they mean, as I decoded the article anyway. Um, no, I also spent, I spent like 10 minutes with the paper when I was first reading it, trying to make sure that I figured out what they meant. What is the difference between non-normative and not the sensible standard? Because it seems that you say it's the same thing. I think maybe, maybe non-normative is a, is a, is a future directed and standard is past, or it is past evaluative. I'm not actually sure. This I would have to, I have a, I have a, an acquaintance who uh, knows this literature better than me, a third-hand acquaintance who I've been meaning to talk to more about this stuff. Uh, <coughs> but yeah, very fine point. No, I, that's, that's my decode anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, it's certainly not how we mean it. Okay, uh, and this was just like half a joke, but, um, <laughs> uh, but ambiguity in practice. Uh, but that was, I have Indeed. a more, uh, more substantial a question that relates to um, to previous questions, I guess. Uh, so, indeed, what you track sometimes will be generality rather, and maybe you can filter that out in some ways. Um, but there's something also something that you don't track in, in ambiguity, it seems, and maybe the one a kind of ambiguity that is more dangerous. Uh, which is where people really are talking about the same things. They are really uh, using exactly the same words, uh, but they mean something different. Uh, yeah. uh, they have diff deep debates on, like typically in philosophy, when you have uh, uh, deep debates about concepts, Good. this literature, the people from the different uh, uh, parts of the debate, they will ideally Good. interact and use exactly the same words to yeah. be able to interact, maybe even like negatively. This person feels that uh, mental properties are associated to causal stuff and so on, but like in a, in a, in a quoting way. The, the, pro and uh, contra, the pro and contra papers are going to have this exactly the same uh, exactly, sy syntactic profile. Exactly. That's, yeah. I think that's kind of ambiguity that is maybe more dangerous than... Yeah somebody applying biodiversity more to 
operational stuff and somebody else looking at it from a very um, like theoretical perspective. Good. And those people will use completely different words, but they're not deeply or not problematically ambiguous. Uh, they might sort of deeply refer to a very similar concept, uh, um, yeah, do but do it in a very different way. And that may be the kind of ambiguity that actually is positive. And so, so yeah, yeah, this. Is yeah, no, like, like I, like, like, for instance, uh, I'm trying to think of a good, of a good example, a good short example, like. If you fed a giant metaphysics corpus at this thing, the ambiguity of the term property would probably be very small. Yes. Very, 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 very small. Because, yeah, everybody, I mean, of course, there's no, there's no agreement about what it is. But everybody talks about it the same way. <laughs> like, we all, we, all, we, all have the same, we all have the same argument with the same words. Yeah. Um, no, that's really, I mean, that's a really important and a very nice point. All I can say is... This is again, now this is a hunch, and I think this is, so what's bad about this is this is a hunch that now, so given that I've just spent like an hour saying that part of the point of what I'm doing is that I am tired of having hunches that I don't know how to confirm. Let me give you a hunch that I don't know how to confirm. Um, and that is, my hunch is that, that the debate in these contexts is just not sophisticated enough to converge in that kind of way. Um, I'm trying. I mean, of course, you could. You would detect it empirically, right? I mean, it would. It would. It would detect. It would. It would appear as a like weirdly small level of of an absolute level of, of of ambiguity in the sense that in the sense that I developed here. Um, and I mean, that's a possible outcome. I, I find it very unlikely. And again, unconfirmable hunch, untested, un uh, so not even really, I don't want to say unconfirmable, I can, I can give you, I can say a low value, or a, the presence of that low value would be vague evidence that this thing was happening. Um, I tend to think that any corpus broad enough to capture the kinds of phenomena that I'm interested in will be too diverse to converge sufficiently. Um, but I think you're right. That's actually a very interesting point. It's something that I should, I should think a bit more about at a, at a higher level of generality. That is to say, uh, this kind of methodology is just going to be rankly inapplicable to certain kinds of dispute. And I think it's a good idea for me to sit down and try to characterize more precisely, like, what kind of dispute is that? Um, and maybe I, so the, this, is, this, this literally just flashed into my head. I have, I have I've not yet thought about this at all. But like, maybe I could try to do something like driving a wedge between a notion of ambiguity and just a notion of disagreement. And so I might just want to say that so what philosophers are doing is it's not being ambiguous, we're just disagreeing. Right. Um, and maybe there's a profitable way to distinguish those two phenomena That's and to be able to test them. That seems you know, in a row, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it, it, it's the robustly being sure that you're seeing one and not the other, though, that's the interesting challenge. And you're exactly right. I need, to think, I need to think harder about a kind of... It didn't occur to me just because it never crossed my mind that, that the kinds of corpora that I'd be interested in would even possibly have this feature. Although, as soon as you say it, I mean, yeah. Like I said, it's, I mean, the, philosophy is a great example where, I mean, obviously, it's just none of this would work at all. Uh. Uh, I have... More questions, but maybe other people want to. Do. No, I, I could maybe add to, to, to what you say. Perhaps philosophy is a very special case, in, as compared to to um, to the diverse literature, because of course you're going to have papers and debates which debate what diverse means. But I think, and this is it's also a hunch, but, but a bit, I would say, substantiated. Most of the uses is, is, is a particular. I would say it's a particular use of the concept of biodiversity. They're using mm -hmm. a particular term, um, so there you're not going to see perhaps ambiguity within within one of those uh, specific mm -hmm, topic. Um, 
because the debate is at least at least it's not it's not explicit. Um, so there is one specific use, one specific uh, I would say uh, constant of by the way scale play. Um, so it's not use, use use mention is gone in these kinds of analyses too, of course, which yeah. is a, a notable problem, right? I think it's not as antagonistic as, as philosophy. That's what I'm, I'm trying to say. You um, obviously know the literature much better than I, but, but this seems implausible to me. I mean, that it's in philosophy more than in that field, yeah, of course. But uh, like, I can't imagine these people don't having like this kind of debates well biodiversity you have to treat it uh, as objectively as possible and other people uh, as say you got to look more into the effects of it and something like that uh, no, they, they do exist but I feel like it's it's more uh, this different kind of articles right I think more like opinion pieces or, or reviews uh, articles yeah. where those things are explicitly discussed but you're going to have a lot of very technical Papers where yeah, they use yeah, certain, yeah, yeah. but that but that connects to a nice point about corpus construction, right? That I hadn't thought of. That actually excluding that kind of thing is probably right. a very good idea. It's not going to be uh, easy because sometimes it, it, it's not under the title yeah. of review article, but right. Um, but I think at least in in, in the literature I've seen, um, you do see roughly separated uh, those two kinds. I see. No, no, that's a very good. Point. But what I mean, about social sciences? They debate of the sense of term regularly. Yeah. Much more maybe than certain kind of biology. So so I'm not sure it's science philosophy, it's maybe kinds of science mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. moments in science. Mm -hmm. That gets at I mean that gets at you know, I, I, I hand waved at this, right? Like things are gonna get weird if you have the same authors in the same papers using multiple contexts or comparing different contexts, and, you know, this kind of thing, sort of mixing everything together and yeah, like a review article is gonna be may, may really be a mess. Um, yeah. Some of these models, I don't have this ability in the kind of system that I use. Some of these models actually have it set up where you can look at, you can go look at the text and actually ask it, so this particular instance of the word biodiversity, which topic did you think that that got pulled out of? For that one, right there. Um, you can sometimes, I've seen, I've seen papers where people have produced figures that look like that. Um, every word with a little box and a number around it, right? It's like, oh, that's kind of cool. Uh, I'm, I'm, I am not, uh, uh, technically, in fact, I'm not exactly sure how that is supposed to work. Uh, I do not believe that the kind of inference method that is implemented in the software packages that I use gives you that level of grain. Uh, yeah. Yeah? Uh, I have kind of a wild uh, uh, yes. suggestion cool. of, of how to you could they could also treat this and, and I don't know whether it makes any sense. But just you know. Um, so it can't be any wilder than this algorithm that I literally <laughs> came up with yesterday. Oh, yeah, so it's fire wilder. Wilder. It's much wilder <laughs> and, and, and probably more intractable, but still computationally uh, oper operational. Uh, so the idea would be that uh, these concepts have a historical development. Uh, they are not standing on their own in a paper and maybe you get a much more nuanced view on the ambiguity if you're going to look at the his history of the, of the word like to which papers do they refer uh, and how is the what are the other words uh, 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 associated to it in those papers and then like track a line or a, a, a tree or something like that, wow. historical tree to to sort of find the conglomerate of of usages yeah. that 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 are associated. So I imagine that if somebody uses biodiversity in a sense that is Sense of it. Uh, sure, sure, yeah. It, it's, it's usually because they refer to a certain literature that also uses in that way, and 
that, that it tracks down to probably some common core at some point of, of, of but 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 it has like it, it spreads wildly uh, and 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 I guess you can find the the the, the ambiguity by the distance, not the sort of uh, like quite coarse grain distance that. Uh, uh, you refer to but, yeah. but like at a, a, a more fine grading by looking yeah. how far they are in this like wild uh, genealogical tree uh -huh. of the development of these co contexts. Uh, co -co I like this idea. The, 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 I can't. There, there will be there will be one problem, and I don't know. I don't know how strong it will be. Um, I would have to. This is a, this is again an empirical question. Um, one thing that I have, so I haven't done a large amount of citation network analysis yet, uh, uh, some on it with, with Luca. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, that's what I thought about. Yeah. It, actually, yeah. Um, you might be interested. So, one thing that I have heard people say in this context is there actually is an intuition that we all have that's usually wrong, and that is citation networks are a whole lot sparser than you think they are. Everything's a lot more isolated than you think, which is kind of surprising. You know, we all, I mean, I share it too, right? You have this intuition that like, co-citation networks, it shouldn't be that hard to get to, to get to a last common ancestor for a paper ought to be like pretty close, right? Harder than you think. Uh -huh. um, the networks are, there's a lot less overlapping citation than it seems like there is, which is weird. Yeah, if I use a concept, I usually refer to people who also use yeah, no, I don't, in the same I don't, sense, I don't, right? Um, Faintly the same sense. And so, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know whether that would be enough of a problem to pose a problem, right? I don't know if that's actually an issue that would, that would make this not work or not. It might, it might not be to the extent that it mattered. Um, but that's a really, but that's a really cool idea. One thing that, that this connects to something that I didn't, that I didn't talk about here. I had thought about putting it in, and I took it out. Um, I am interested in thinking about. So one thing that, that kind of went away in here, right, was uh, individual documents. Uh, and I mean, you have that level in these in this representation. You can go back to documents somehow. And I'm not yet sure, like, how, like, what are, and this is a, this is a, this is a, a possible way to do that, I mean, and an possibly interesting and and, and 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 fun way to do that because I, I'm not sure how to connect the kind of stuff that I've been hand waving at with, you know, so say I want to get insight about particular papers, um, or, I mean, other than sort of the kinds of things that you already knew and you didn't need this out, this kind of approach to be able to tell you, which is, you know, what are the most important papers in this subject, in this journal, in this time? You know, that's usually a pretty easy thing to already know uh, if you have the background knowledge that you need. Um, and so that could be a fun way to kind of reconnect to, to kind of individual doc document level stuff. Um, I have to think about that. It's another nice thing about biodiversity, is because since the topic uh, only dates from whatever, 1990, uh, you can get pretty good citation data for the entire history of the topic, which is the word, which is pretty cool. Uh, you know, I can't do that with most of the other things I work on. Uh, Life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, citation data is garbage before about, well, it's really garbage before about 1950 because people just didn't cite the same way that we do now. Citation didn't mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, or my... But, but uh, even with all the, the caveat that you just said, I would be curious yeah. to correlate your analysis of context metric and uh, the, uh, length of uh, co-citation just to yeah. see if there's yeah. something if it tracks. that looks, that see something. Yeah. As an explorer. I also, I had, to go, I had to poke around and see if somebody has already played with this kind of thing. Because I know that there are people, I mean, at the super macro level, I know you can do similar kinds of things. Uh, you can cluster the citation networks, and basically you should do it for, you know, all of science. And you roughly see disciplines 
form as islands in the network. So I mean, at some kind of hyper macro level, we know that this works. Um, which has to make one think that somebody would have tried to make it work at, the, at, a, at a more micro level too. Um, I would go play Very that. small citation network are used to, to see the impact of a research, a particular research right. of the, the brain of two sub disciplines inside a very narrow discipline. But, but I, don't, I don't know enough to say, but I would be curious that, to see how it's correlated to your context analysis because maybe you could see it, it would be quite anecdotal. <laughs> in the in the in the diffusion of something that is not very long because you're right these these trees are not as big as you would think. If there's a complete change of context, yeah, or not. I mean, this is this is something that I have wanted to do for years and just haven't gotten a technical handle on yet. I mean, I think one thing that is cool about excuse me the kind of work that I've been doing. Um, so I've been working with full article texts, which most people don't do because most people didn't bother getting the copyright access negotiated. Um, what I haven't done that I think would be really neat is to think about how you can sort of induce networks of meaning and similarity from text and compare them with the induced networks from citation, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I think it'd be really cool. I don't think anybody's playing. Well, if you I mean, obviously people but I mean, I think it'd be really neat. I think it could help you answer all, as you say, answer all kinds of really interesting questions about about what happens in these in these cases of knowledge diffusion. Um, and I just haven't. Well, I haven't gotten the uh, the citation analysis prowess up to speed yet that I that I would want. And in very clean corpus. Yeah. Um, yeah. If there's problem if it, it's not clean before because people go in non-standard way they make a mistake about names you need clean corpus to yep. do that. And, and it's the kind of thing where you're going to want to be able to um, after a lot of experience with very dirty corpora because most of my most of my text is nasty um, I think I think it's fair to say the way that I usually describe that is uh, uh, corpus cleanliness doesn't stop you from drawing results, but it does stop you from or dirty corpus does stop you from drawing conclusions based on small sample size, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what you want to be able to do in that kind of context. You know, either to say that you know. There's exactly four of these in the corpus, and that's meaningful. Or there's more to the point, something that I can never do because my corpus is too dirty. I can never say that there's none of something. Because I never know whether the absence of something is, an, is, a, is, a, noise, is a noise artifact. I would never go on record as saying, you know, nobody in 1948 talked about the term X in the journal Y. Because I just don't believe my data well enough to be able to make a categorical claim like that. Um, and that's exactly what you, yeah, as you said, you need that, you need to be able to, to make those small n inferences. On the other hand, if you work full text and you have a dirty corpus, you can still do some kind of sample analysis to convince yourself that even with the dirty corpus, it's not garbage. Right. But for citations, there's, it's not big enough. Yeah. So if you miss, you know, a, an important link between two community that the, the, there's a diffusion of the article of 1905 of Einstein, because this is the example I have in mind, oh, yeah. where they prove that Poincaré has no impact at all. So even if you discover something about, nobody quoted. So, wow. so you can, but these are small networks, so, so if you miss two links uh -huh. at strategic time, because people put two N for a name compared to one N in German, you need a clean corpus. Though. Yeah, yeah. And if you and again, and you're trying to prove a negative, yeah, so of course. of course, it better be shiny. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, and that's I mean that's always been it's been one of 
my kind of constant background challenges has been has been playing with messy data because I just know that I'm not going to get anything better. So, you know, it is what it is. Uh, but yeah, no, 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 it's a. It's Uh, just a question. Yeah. Or you just want to finish your no, 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 no. I was, I was just trailing off. So, I, I, I wonder uh, what or could ever be the purpose of uh, defending a concept that is sufficiently ambiguous. Because if I think about what are the first principles of philosophy, the Cartesian principles is to, to render concepts or thoughts or ideas as clear as distinct as possible. So we consider that a philosophical virtue. So if you defend something that could be sufficiently ambiguous to use in this and that context. So either you're changing the first principles of philosophy or you're doing something other virtuous. Um, you were not convinced by the list of the good? <laughs> no, well... <laughs> I mean, no... Also, I, and I can already ask a second <coughs> question that you don't... might be related, like for instance, what is wrong with defending uh, biodiversity as the number of species per square meter and say that everything else should be ha should have another name. So. Yeah, no, and I mean, the short answer to that is, I mean, the short answer is nothing. I mean, I think uh, uh, there is there is nothing wrong with that as a move. Um, and there are a bunch of very <coughs> credentialed uh, credentialed biologists who absolutely would want to would want to make that would want to make that kind of a that kind of a move, and that's. On the one hand, I don't, I don't, I don't see anything wrong with that. On the other hand, I mean, I think, I think actually, what I, what I want to do is, I want to take the other, I want to take the other, the other order of your dilemma. I do want to say that in this case, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not offering a classic, traditional kind of conceptual analysis of biodiversity here. I mean, I don't think that, I don't think that's what this project is about. In part because, I think. The pragmatics of engaging in debates around biodiversity right now um, there's no I want to say this I'm not I'm not I'm not I don't think as pretentious as I know that I am I'm not pretentious enough to say that I think I'm going to convince everyone involved in 21st century biodiversity protection uh, to, you know, after reading one or 12 papers by me to adopt the sole correct definition of biodiversity. And so in some sense, this is a, and in that sense, this is not traditional philosophy. This is something with a different collection of virtues, right? I, I, am, I am forced to respond to the facts on the ground. And the facts on the ground are that this seems like, again, with the caveat that I think is that I take this to be an open empirical question, this seems like a problematically ambiguous concept as it's actually being used. And that's analyzable, right? Even if, even if it's maybe also lamentable, and I mean, Perhaps fair. I mean, I you know you you could you could just lament this state of affairs, um, but it's an analyzable and comprehensible state of affairs. And so I think you know in the kinds of the kinds of conceptual analysis tools that we have as philosophers of science, I think they can be deployed against ambiguous concepts. And so, yeah, I think it's worth I think it's worthwhile to try. Um, you know, at the end of the day, might it be better if we could wrestle everyone into into consensus. It, it might. I mean, I will I will give you that. Um, but I still think there's there's good and interesting and exciting analytic work to do in the absence of that of that kind of consensus. Uh, I mean, there could be so interesting ambiguity to describe as there are many concepts like uh, analytic truth or, or, or knowledge but i don't think biodiversity there's no i mean there's no reason yet to consider biodiversity of um, to have an ambiguity of that kind i, I think it mm. could still be okay. very much dissolvable of uh, uh, what you want to represent with it good so I, I think 
part of the argument that there that there is an interesting ambiguity of that sort, and this this is that I that I didn't talk about uh, didn't talk about today. Um, part of the argument that there is an interesting ambiguity of that sort is that ambig interesting. Well, we could disagree about whether or not this is interesting, but I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. I think interesting ambiguities of that sort are induced in concepts when part of what's when part of what leads to those ambiguities are uh, uh, value differences. And I just, I just take that from the you know the values the values in science literature over the last over the last twenty five years. I think that's actually a really cool way, an interesting <coughs> philosophically analyzable uh, trenchant uh, uh, kind of kind of difference in in uh, signification of concepts when they're induced by underlying value differences and a, a kind of background behind the hunch that I have that in fact. I do agree with the hunch of everyone else that, that, that uh, the term is ambiguous. Behind that hunch is a hunch that there are, there are these kinds of, of underlying non-epistemic value disagreements over how the concept is being used. And that, I think, is the kind of thing that philosophers are really good at taking apart uh, and can contribute to illuminating. Uh, Maybe in the end, I mean, again, yeah, I, I, I think it's, I think it, you, you've got to, you've got to admit, uh, if you're in my position, that maybe in the end, uh, either, as I already said, maybe it's less ambiguous than we think, or maybe uh, what happens when you look at the ambiguity and you explore the contexts where there are ambiguous usage. You actually just find people saying lots of really dumb things about biodiversity. I actually think that's actually a very possible <laughs> outcome. I'm not entirely sure what I would do with it yet, if that actually is what's going on. I, mean, I think that's actually quite possible. Uh, just kind of nonsensical stuff. Uh, but I think we, we, have to, we have to figure it out first. You know, I think the first step is to, under, is to understand it, uh, map it, explore it. And then, and then think about conceptual interventions, conceptual engineering, consensus building, et cetera. So. Do we have still time? Uh, I, I'm giving the time. Uh, well, it's all two, but maybe you want to uh, add on. You're the president, so I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys, this was great.